Welcome to the Seahawkers podcast with your hosts, Adam Emmert. Why didn't we get that? I feel cheated by the football gods. And Brandon Schultz. It's going to be the 2012 draft of compensatory picks in 2020. Go Hawks! This is the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy, Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Yeah, man, we had to get on the mic here. I'm coming at you all the way from uh, Monticello, Arkansas. What a beautiful, amazing place (laughs) it is here in Monticello, Arkansas. And since I had so much to do today, I thought maybe I'd just squeeze in a podcast since there's been a little news since the last time we did this. We've we've had a few things happen. And to be honest, I don't know if I've, I've quite come to grips with all the news that's happened since the last time that you and I have sat down to do this, because Doug Baldwin has been released by the Seahawks. Yeah, I'm calling shenanigans on this and I'll elaborate later Okay, as we get to it. But I'm calling shenanigans. I hope you're right, because I'm yeah, it's been a few days now and I. I've seen some articles about Doug Baldwin posting like his retirement tweet, uh, Game of Thrones style, uh, him doing a series of tweets about, you know, speaking to the younger Doug Baldwin and kind of encapsulating the entire career of Baldwin. Yeah, I went through those. I can't look at it. Can't you? No, can't do it. I'm still in the in the denial phase. Okay. well, we'll we'll get to that. There's other news, too. Yeah. There's good news. Okay. Well, let's let's finish with the bad news because Cam Chancellor, uh, the news that he was being released also announced at the same time as Doug Baldwin. Uh, but it, we've had some time to prepare for that news. That's no news. We knew. Yeah. I mean, he was he's been retired for a year. It's a team transaction that occurred. So it is news. No, it is not news. It's it's housekeeping. Like Cam's been gone for a long time now. I mean, other than the cap money. Great. What? I, he was gone anyways. I'd rather have the cap money now. He ain't coming back. I I understand. Yeah. I just can't get all excited about having cap money versus having Cam Chancellor and Doug Baldwin. Well, okay. So Doug Baldwin, yes. Like, I'm still like, I'm, I'm struggling with that. But Cam Chancellor, like, I'm, I broke up with him a long time ago. Like, we're fine. And I'm really I'm still hoping for the best for him going forward, like with his career and everything, you know, after football careers, right? all that stuff. I hope he's doing well. Hope his neck is good. I think he walked away at the right time because he was still walking. I think that was good. Like, I'm fine. Like the camp stuff doesn't bother me. Now I'm just like, oh, finally, we get the cap space for camp. That's cool. But as far as the Doug part of it, Catfish! Fuck, dude, like I, I'm having I'm having problems with that still. I, I, I wrap my head around that. And that's why I'm calling shenanigans. <laughs> I don't I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't want to believe it either. But like you said, we will get into it and let's get to the good news because uh, Seahawks free agency period has officially started. Yes. And Ziggy Anza from the Detroit Lions coming to the Seattle Seahawks signs a deal about eight million dollars, nine million. It, we finally have some contract details. It seems like when it first when we first heard heard about it, someone said five and a half million. Someone said 13 or 14 million. And it turns out to be right about in the middle there somewhere. Yeah. Like, what was this thing? Was it between Rappaport and Schefter? Is that what it was going back and forth on this? Where it's like dueling reports on the money and when Ziggy would play. Like one of them was like, yeah, it's 14 million and he's not going to play until maybe like the last week of the season or some crap. Right. (laughs) Or is it like a month into the season? It was a month into the season. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the other report was like, no, it's more like five and he'll be like ready to rock first day of camp. (laughs) So it's like, wait, wait, what is this? What is this battle? Like, one of you guys get your catfish together here and tell me the real news. Come on. Joel Corey on the official numbers for Ziggy Anza. Nine million dollars uh, breaks up into a three and a half million signing bonus, two and a half million fully guaranteed salary, one and a half million in 53 man roster bonuses, and then another one and a half million in 46 man roster bonuses. And it works out his actual cap number for 2019. Seven point nine million. Right. Which is awesome. Like that's a bargain deal for a guy that can be ultra productive. Is it a risk? Yes. I mean, he's had many injuries over the course of his career and he's been a little up and down. But when he's on it, like he's one of the best. And that's about the best you can do under the circumstances with Frank Clark basically pushing his way out of town. 
with his contract demands. And really, you've turned Frank Clark and what you would have paid him into what five draft picks and Ziggy Ansa and another 10 million in cap space. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Like, I think at the end of the day, that's a great move for the Seahawks when you're looking at building for the future with the idea that you are pay, paying Russell Wilson what you're paying him. The idea that you are going to have to pay Jaron Reed, that you are going to have to pay Bobby Wagner. This helps with all of that. Plus, it brings in an infusion of new talent with a lot of young guys this year and a huge draft haul for next year because they played the little compensatory pick game that everybody loves to talk about that makes them sound like they're smart. and They know things about the NFL. Yeah, all those, you know, I think I've pointed out how well those compensatory picks have worked out in the past, too. Yeah. All those great players like Malcolm Smith and Mm -hmm. Mark Lewinsky, the top two names of all time compensatory picks for the Pete Carroll and John Schneider era. Hey, Glow's a starter in this league. Hey, so. I, hey both those guys are two great players, you know, two solid players. Those are the best examples. Like, I could right. run down the rest of the list and you'd be like, who? Who's that guy? He was on the team? So, what I'm hearing from you is that they're due. They're totally due. They're going to hit on every single compensatory pick. Yeah. See, you got to change your perspective on this. It's going to be the 2012 draft of compensatory picks in 2020. It's how they reload around Russell Wilson. And we have the next era of great Seahawks football coming up here. Now that, uh, you know, kind of the Legion of Boom era is uh, closing. Yeah. The Legion of Boom era closing. Pretty much everybody except for KJ Wright. Wags. Yeah, Bobby Wagner and Russell Wilson. That's it. That's it. That's all that's left. There's no way you could have told me in 2015 that this is where we'd be at going into this season. No way. I guess maybe you can put Justin Britt on that list. Well, he was 2014. Yeah. So from the 2013 team. Right. Is that really it? I know. I didn't want this episode to be depressing, even though I knew it was going to be a little bit because Doug Baldwin was going to get mentioned. So here's the thing about all of this. Think about the way the Patriots have gone about their business over the course of the last 20 years, right? You're 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 trying to bring up the Patriots to make me feel better. This is not going to make me feel better. It better make you feel better because they're doing it the right way. It's not going to make me feel better. Uh, Do Super Bowls not make you feel better? Does it not feel good to win? Every time I hear the Patriots, I think about 2014, and then I and then my mind goes places it shouldn't go. Problem. It sounds like instead of focusing on the positives, you're you're a negative Nancy today, and apparently I'm I'm poly positive somehow. I don't know how these roles got reversed, but here we are. So basically, you look at the Patriots and the little mini runs they've had within their run, right? I mean, there was that Willie McGinnis, Troy Brown kind of era, right? Then it was the Randy Moss, Tom Brady, high flying offense kind of era. And then it was Gronk and Edelman, right? Yeah. And they've kind of have these different versions of the team that have all gone on it to win Super Bowls. And now we're on to our second version. And it's exciting. We get all these new guys that come in that we get to wrap our arms around and fall in love with again. This is great. Plus, we still get to keep a couple of the old stalwarts that we know and love. I mean, KJ and Bobby and Russ. Like, I, yeah, this is going to be fun, dude. Like, I'm excited. This, this totally takes my fandom and gives it new juice. And I, I like it. Well, good. So you're telling me that DK Metcalf is our Randy Moss. I'm all in. Dude, if that turns out that way, I will eat my hat and be the happiest dude in the world to do it. That ain't happening. But, (laughs) dude, if he could just be a good receiver, that'd be great. You're telling me you're not buying into all the DK Metcalf hype? Because that's all I'm seeing since the draft is, is to believe in this hype. There is no more hyped wide receiver going into 2019 out of this draft class than DK Metcalf. Yeah, and that's going to be tough for a lot of people to swallow when he doesn't play a lot throughout the first uh, eight weeks of the season or so. Well, he's Look, a it's rookie. tough for a rookie receivers to adjust to the league. It always yeah. has been, always will be. I mean, the only guy that maybe really just, oh, well, there's a few guys that tore it up. I mean, Anquan Bolden, Randy Moss, right? But for the most part, guys come in and they struggle for a year or two. It's just the way it goes. But he looks amazing running against air. With no with no corners. <laughs> He's a talk at camp. I saw the highlight video that the Seahawks put out of him just like trotting down the sideline and just catching lazy passes. Yeah. Like, wow. I'm wowed. <laughs> I'm not saying he won't be good. I'm just saying like I'm temp- I'm not buying into the the hype just yet. Odell Beckham had a solid rookie season. Did you mention Moss? You mentioned Bolden. 
Yeah, I mentioned Moss. He had he one of the, the best rookie on fire. season. He had one of the best rookie seasons of all time. Was that ninety eight? Something like that. Yeah, Percy yeah. Harvin had a good rookie season. Yeah, I mean it happens. I'm just saying more often than not, it that's not the way it goes. It usually Doug Baldwin had a good rookie season. Well, to get you know seven hundred yards, he led the team in receptions as an undrafted free agent. That's a hell of a rookie year. Fifty one receptions, seven hundred eighty eight yards. Getting back to Baldwin. It's going to get me choked up again. Oh, Jesus. You're, you're a little emotional today. I'm telling you, I out of all the players that have left the team, mm-hmm. this is this has been the one that I've had the hardest time with. Yeah, you and me both. With Earl, you know, it was OK. With Cam, it was tough. Cliff was probably the next toughest for me just because I, I liked April so much. Uh, Sherman leaving the team. That wasn't as, as difficult to, to deal with. Marshawn Lynch. For me, it'd be Marshawn, Baldwin, Cam, Sherm, and then Earl in that order. See, it's it's Baldwin, Cliff, Marshawn for me. I never got really attached to Cliff Averill. Like, I mean, he was a lion as much as he was a Seahawk in a lot of ways. Shut your dirty mouth. I'm just saying that's just how his career went. Kind of like Ziggy. If Ziggy turns in three great years here, you know, parlay is a one year deal into another like two year extension or something like that. Like, are you going to think of him as a Seahawk or Lion? You never know. Well, you don't know. And he has spent five years with the Lions. He, mm-hmm. well, I guess it's six years with the Lions. Yeah. Cause he had his four year contract. They picked up his fifth year option. Then right. he played under the franchise tag with the Lions mm-hmm. last year. Ended up only playing, he only started two games. And played in seven last year because of his injuries. But his career to me with Ziggy Anza, it really breaks down. His first three years as a Lion were incredible. You know, capped off by a trip mm-hmm. to the Pro Bowl with over 14 sacks in one of the seasons. And, you know, solid rookie year, a good second year. And then he really dropped off in 2016, but he picked it back up in 2017. And then that franchise tag year when he fought through injuries, it just he had one solid season of the last three looking at his stats. It definitely jumps out at how much success he had early on in his first three years as a lion versus his last three years. And for a guy that's going to be 30 years old going into into a Seahawks career, he didn't play a ton in college. You know, he came to a really raw prospect coming out of college. But you see the talent as being there with a guy like Ziggy Anza. Yeah, the talent is there. And basically, at the end of the day, you're trying to replace Frank Clark's, you know, 12 to 14 sacks in a year. Right. That's what you're that's what you're trying to accomplish. Right. With him being gone and with the guys you're bringing in. So let's play some realistic expectations on Ziggy. Let's say he picks up six, seven sacks. Right. That's half of what you're looking for right there. You telling me you can't get the other half from uh, improvement from Rasheem Green? How about, you know, the number one uh, draft pick for the Seahawks, LJ Collier, Jamie Martin with improvement coming into year two, Puna Ford, Jaron Reed continuing to be a monster on the inside. Cassius Marsh coming back. Yeah, Cassius Marsh. Look, he can get you two to three sacks, right? Sure. You're telling me that you can't manufacture a pass rush that looks similar to what they had done in the past? Because I know they can. And the reason I know they can is I went back and looked. The Seahawks year in, year out, despite the fact that we've had years where it felt like we're loaded on defensive line and years where it feel, felt like we're a little leaner when it came to the defensive line and pass rush like this last year. Yet somehow, some way, the Seahawks always seem to hover right around 40 sacks within two to three for the year. Two to three sacks for the year within 40 sacks. I think they can easily accomplish that again this year with the group of guys that they have, plus with the cap money that they saved, uh, they are able to go out and maybe even bring in one more pass rusher. You know, they are looking for more run stuffers, too, because they brought in, uh, you know, some guy named Wood, who's big. <laughs> yeah, Al Woods, our, our next generic interior defensive lineman named guy. Right. You go, you yeah. go from Tom Johnson to Al Woods. And yeah, he just stands there and makes sure nobody runs past him. And he's good at that. I'm a little bit disappointed that they had to go to Al Woods and they couldn't find another one of the 2013 first rounders. (laughs) Haven't they tried them all at this point? (laughs) They brought in Luke Jokel, who was the number two overall. Deion Jordan was the number was on the team. Number three overall. Ziggy Anza was the fifth pick overall in 2013. Barkevious Mingo was the sixth overall. 
you know, DJ Fluker was number 11 overall. Sheldon Richardson played on the team. He was the 13th overall pick. We're almost getting through them all. I'm wondering, you know, when are we going to get to Bjorn Werner, who played defensive end for the Colts or, you know, Dayton Jones? You know, he's he's got to be bumping around out there. Bjorn Warner is back in Germany making BMWs or something. <laughs> like he's, he's not in the league no more. Bjorn Werner. I mean, maybe he is. I don't know. I, I don't know either. It, I, off, he doesn't. But. He doesn't jump out as a name that uh, is is still actually playing. No, definitely not. Boy, that was a terrible draft class. It wasn't the Seahawks' best class either. No, no, no. It's like not even the Seahawks. I'm talking overall in the league because we bring it these guys from all these other teams, right? Oh yeah. Like R- Richardson's a mild hit. Ansa has been a decent hit. Like who else? Like the rest of those guys pretty much stink. Fluker. Like he's turned out to be okay for us because our style fits his style, but he was considered a bust for the longest time. Really, the guys toward the back end of the first round, the names like Desmond Trufant, Xavier Rhodes, DeAndre Hopkins, you know, those are the names that jump out to me. Yeah, and, and Nuke being about the only one that I look at as a real, you know, legitimate game changer. Yeah. Levy and Bell went in the second round that year. Yeah. Travis Kelsey yep. in the third round. That might be your best pickup. Yeah, it was just a weak draft. So when people kill John Schneider for not replicating the same success in each and every draft, well, the talent's also got to be there. Part of the reason why John Schneider gets crushed for that draft is he was tied for the most selections that year. He had 11 picks and landed zero of them. Well, yeah, it turns out there wasn't really any dudes. The best one was Luke Wilson, I think, out of out of everybody in the 2013 draft. Nobody did well in that draft. Like, can we all just get a pass on that one? The Chiefs did all right. They got Eric Fisher and Travis Kelsey. They got Travis Kelsey. Eric Fisher hasn't been great for them. Not for where they picked him. I suppose. It's not good value. Okay. Well, how about the Eagles who got Zach Ertz and Lane Johnson? Congratulations to them. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. I'm just saying they could have done better. Well, I'm excited about this draft, so I'm not too worried about 2013 anymore. Hey, our guys got their numbers. I'm sure they'll change. DK Metcalf, number 14. Seems kind of weird. Yeah. Well, that was his number in college, was it not? I don't know. I'm pretty sure it was. LJ Collier, number 95. Marquise Blair, number 27. Travis Homer, number 25. Ben Burkirvan, number 55. There's a good linebacker number. That is. Hey, how about uh, the undrafted free agent, Devontae Davis, getting number 22? I'd hate to be CJ Procise. Wait a second, you gave my number to a, a dude who's undrafted? I'm, I'm still on this team, right? No, you're not. We, we've gone over this, Brandon. <laughs> That's how you find out that you're, 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 the expectations are the high. Plans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe when they draft a, another running back in the seventh round to replace you, that might be a clue, too. RIP, CJ Procise, even though you're still on the team. Talented guy, could have been great, but health is a part of talent, and he didn't have that talent. Some other new guys added to the team. Geno Smith, quarterback. We got we we finally found our number three quarterback, Adam. Uh, well, he's coming in for a visit. He's not, he's not signed yet. Oh, I thought I saw that he signed. I, I can't wait for the camp battle between uh, Geno Smith and Paxton Lynch. I mean, hide the women and children up on the berm at the VMAC because there's going to be balls going everywhere. Loose balls. According to a source, Geno Smith to sign with the Seahawks. Yeah. Well, then also the report started coming out from like NFL.com and like the more reputable stuff saying that he has set up a visit for Wednesday. No. All right. It's not a done deal. Geno Smith noted flat earth explorer. Yeah. Well, Geno Smith, also a noted terrible quarterback. (laughs) So I don't I don't understand what John and Pete try to do at the backup quarterback spot. I don't get it. Like Tim moon, uh, one of our great listeners in the ring of honor, he's, he's still hung up on Alex Magoo as, as he should have been the guy to be the backup <laughs> quarterback. I tend to disagree with that. I don't think he's any more special than Paxton Lynch and, or uh, Gino Smith. Um, I think he would have had about the same amount of success, but there's you you got to be able to find a better guy than freaking Geno Smith or Paxton Lynch. I mean, really? Really? Well, they have uh, the South Dakota Jackrabbits quarterback, Taron Christian. True. So he's got to be able to beat those guys out. Wearing Charlie Whitehurst sold number number six. I don't know, man. I just I, I don't understand where they're what they're doing with backup. Quarterback. Maybe they should let me come in and play backup quarterback. 
I can hit a check down. I can do that. I, you know what? I think he would be leading Geno Smith in the, in the quarterback battle by hitting a check down. Hell yeah, I would. I know, I know I could beat Geno Smith out in a quarterback competition. I know I could. <laughs> And the reason why I said flat earth explorer for Geno Smith, you know, he's I I don't buy into the fact that he is actually a flat earther. He he looked like he was, you know, just questioning exploring. the idea. He was questioning the idea. He was looking into it to see how legit it might be. Yeah, good for him. You got to check the info. At least be entertained by the YouTube videos. Oh, hell, if somehow my search history on YouTube got out, like some of the crazy <laughs> that I watch from all over the spectrum, people would think I believe in all sorts of stuff. I don't. Yeah. But you got to check it out. Yeah, you never know. Otherwise, how do you know what you believe in or not? A couple other signings. Fullback Nick Ballore, guard Marcus Martin. Cool. And our guy Nate Orchard is gone now. He was the guy that they cut when they brought on Ziggy Anza. Yeah, okay. The hype for Nate Orchard was strong for a little while. Was it? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think I missed that on the uh, Nate Orchard hype. You, you missed out on it? Yeah. Oh, I, thought, I thought you said, oh, this guy could be good. He got cut from the Browns. Yeah, that sounds like hype. Another guy who's been cut from several teams, Jamar Taylor, now a member of the Seahawks. Another, he's the corner, right? Yeah. He's your, he's your nickel corner that played for Arizona. Everybody and their dog? Yeah. Denver. Let's see how many teams I can come up with at the top of my head. Miami? Cleveland? The Colts? I'm going to say no on the Colts. The South Dakota Jackrabbits? I think you're wrong with the Colts. I'm not saying I know. I just think you could throw out about any team and have about a 82% chance of hitting former Boise state university product. What, what, what state Boise state. You you said it wrong the first time. And that makes people from Boise mad. Did I say Boise? Yeah. You can't go Boise. Oh, it's you can't Boise. do the Z. Okay. Boise, 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 Boise. Yeah. They get pissy, man. They really do. Miami, Cleveland, Arizona, Denver, Seattle. See, we got them all Colts. You went overboard with Colts. I'm just predicting his next team then. How about that? They, they like all the Seahawks cast off corners. All right. We put it off long enough. Are you ready? Okay. You, you know what? You've, you've allowed me some time to ease my way into this news about Doug Baldwin, mm-hmm. a failed physical designation by the Seahawks, why they released both Cam and Doug. But maybe just maybe you're going to provide me with a sliver of hope. Well, all I'm saying is this. I don't believe it. And the, the reason was I was coming into all these rumors, right? That, well, really Pete and John started when the draft was going down, you know, talking about how it was going to be really difficult for Doug to make it back. And I just, it doesn't feel like, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't feel like Doug has lost the desire to play football at all. Like I, I, I really felt like he had two or three years of want to left in the tank. Right. Yeah. And maybe the body, is it going to let him do it right now? And we don't know the full scope of his injuries and everything that he's gone through as far as the surgeries and stuff, but it's not like it's a neck injury like Cliff and Cam, right? I mean, we're talking about a knee and a sports hernia, those sort of things. It just feels like to me that the Seahawks cut him with the injury designation to get the cap space for now to go out and sign a couple other dudes or you know whatever it is they're planning to use it for. Uh-huh. Let Doug quote unquote retire. Everybody says he's retired because he put out some weird Instagram thing or Twitter thing. And again, say it with me. If it's on Twitter, it doesn't matter. Okay. So there's that. That's true. Marshawn Lynch retired on Twitter the first time. I'm telling you, I'm not wrong. Like all the contract numbers for Ziggy Onsa just uh, the last week. None of those matter. None of them were right. When he was going to play and when he wasn't. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Twitter doesn't matter. So that part of it, like, it's hard for me to buy into. And this feels like to me that he just needs some time to heal up. Maybe a season off. But what I would expect more is more like half a season off. Let's say the Seahawks are something like, I don't know, six and four, you know, in week 10. You know, just maybe a game out of the Rams and looking like they could make a run and uh, you know, there's one happens to be one injury at receiver and Pete gives Doug a call. Hey, hey, Doug, how you feeling? Maybe you want to go on a playoff run here. You want to come back for a little bit? You're telling me Doug Baldwin doesn't want to do that. That guy with that competitive spirit doesn't want to do that. I think that's my prediction. 
I think he comes back either midseason this year or he comes back next year. He's not going to play for another team. He's going to want to come back and play with Russ. I like where your head's at. I I don't know if it's going to happen, but it allows me to hold out for a little bit of hope. I'm wondering, though, because we have a tradition here on the show, Adam, Mm -hmm. when we have a a legendary Seahawks player leave the team Mm -hmm. who seemingly is going into retirement. We did it with Marshawn. We did it with Cam. Mm -hmm. Do we do an episode dedicated to Doug Baldwin before the comeback? No, no, no. So we have to wait, what, like a full whole year? Well, number one, he hasn't retired. Well, he's been released, though. Yes, that doesn't mean he's retired. He's been released, dummy, because they wanted the money (laughs) for the cap money. And he just needed a few extra weeks to heal up. And they're like. All right, wink, wink, nod, nod. Put some nonsense out on Twitter that, you know, a letter to yourself, which is weird in and of itself, whatever, fine. And like make it sound. He didn't even say the word retirement in the whole thing. But yeah, everybody's like, oh, there's this retirement announcement. You know what you have to do to retire, Brandon? File paperwork with the league. I don't think you do. I don't think you actually have to file paperwork with the league. Yes, you do. I don't think Sean Alexander ever officially retired from the NFL. He did. That's how it works. If he wants to get on the, you know, the pension plan and everything, he's got to do it. You're telling me that a tweet from Doug Baldwin with a Game of Thrones gif of of a guy saying my watch is ended along with the peace symbol doesn't count as a retirement announcement. It counts every bit as much as a pair of cleats hanging on a power line. That might be true. Might be true. But we didn't that. We see this is what I'm trying to get at. We did an episode after the after the cleats were hanging from the power line. Right. And then Marshawn came back. But did we also do an episode about Cam? Yes. Oh, and did he come back? No. Oh, okay. You're saying that Marshawn, Marshawn has ruined Doug Baldwin's farewell episode. Or just when Doug Baldwin fired like here, this is what I'm, I'm saving for you so that you you can have uh, something to look forward to if, or when the day arrives. Right. Okay. You know how it's been like, basically a year for us to you know get cam released you know because of the injury money and all that stuff just imagine like two years from now when doug comes back plays a little bit and then actually retires then you can do your your little you know tribute episode and it'll feel good it'll give you the feels right now you don't need the feels because he's coming back but we did the episode for marshawn lynch and then he came back do we need to therefore do the episode for Doug Baldwin for Doug Baldwin to come back? Like, does this hinge on us? But that's what I was trying to tell you. We did it for Cam and guess what he didn't do? Well, that's true. Yeah. So we're, we're one for one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Doug Baldwin goes out with, if he does in fact go out with one of the greatest seasons of a wide receiver over 30 years old in a Seahawks uniform, in the Pete Carroll era. Shoot. It, How over many 30- qualifiers can you put on that? I, well, I he was, he's one of the greatest Seahawks uh, wide receiver or seasons in the <laughs> Seahawks history with a guy with a last name that started with B who wore green cleats and uh, came from Florida. He had one of the in over 30. It was one of the greatest seasons ever as a Seahawk wide receiver. Well, I only did so much <laughs> research. I can only go back so far. Yeah. When I think of wide receivers over 30 in a Seahawks uniform, I mm-hmm. think of Steve Largent. I think of Bobby Ingram. And I think of Doug Baldwin. But Doug Baldwin only had one season. Jerry Rice doesn't it, make it in there for you? He didn't have that great of a season over 30 for Seattle. No, definitely not. I don't. What did he have? Like 300 yards? Something like that. So it just since 2010 in the Pete Carroll era, the, the most prolific wide receiver over 30 years old was Brandon Stokely in 2010 with 354 yards, zero touchdowns, zero starts. And the only other guys to even suit up over 30 and play a game for Seattle was Brandon Marshall last season at 34. And mm-hmm. then in 2010, Dion Branch at 31 years old. Right. So he's in a pretty small group of dudes for, for there to only be four wide receivers who have actually caught passes from a Seahawks quarterback is, since 2010 over the age of 30. That, that's pretty small company. Yeah, I, somehow you're fascinated by this, and I, I, it doesn't matter to me in any way, shape, or form. I, I, like, yeah, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He had a decent... Th- last year was his worst year because of injury. The first time he ever even missed a game, right, was this last year. 
Uh, yeah, fine. Okay. He, the, if in a sample size of eight years where you've had only a few dudes who's come in to play receiver at an older age, he had the best year of those. Congratulations. Hand him a box of goldfish or I something. Just, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. You're making something up that doesn't matter. The surprising thing to me was that the Seahawks, they, they don't, they don't have wide receivers over 30. Well, just wait until uh, later this season or next year when he comes back and he smashes these numbers. Baldwin did miss two games in his sophomore season. But he's been an Iron Man. For sure. Even last year to play in and start 13 games. With both legs messed up? 618 yards. Yeah, he, he came into the season with a bad knee. And then it was week one that he got hit in the other knee. Right. And he still managed to play 13 games. Does he have girly knee? Is that what the problem is? Todd girly knee? Uh, maybe. I hope not. I know. I want him to come back. I think it's going to happen, dude. I'm just saying. It's going to be hard for me not to put together a, a tribute episode yet. Well, you do you then. Like, whatever you want to do. You put it put together. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to put a tribute episode together of every guy who's played wide receiver for the Seahawks in uh, the Pete Carroll era over the age of 30 who have caught more than four footballs and we can commemorate all of those amazing guys. Dion Branch, Brandon Stokely, Brandon Marshall. Be amazing. Yeah, I bet you people will be riveted. It's pretty amazing that two of those guys named are, are Brandon. Maybe that's why you're fascinated by this. <laughs> Maybe because I'm over 30 and my name is Brandon. I could play receiver for the Seahawks even even as I'm over 30 years old. Look, I, that may or may not be true, <laughs> but I do think that you have a better chance of playing backup quarterback for the Seahawks at this point. Maybe. Mm -hmm. It's third string. Well, who's second string? Oh, yeah. Ru injured Russell Wilson. <laughs> you right. know what? I, I still think I think the next best quarterback behind Russell Wilson doesn't even have QB next to his name. Oh, yeah. It's Keenan Reynolds. You're right. Yeah, we talked about that. He's better than Geno Smith. He's better than Paxton Lynch. Yes. I like Keenan Reynolds better anyways. Overall, Geno Smith has a glass jaw. Paxton Lynch has a dumb millennial name. <laughs> <laughs> there goes there. There goes all our, there goes the our Paxton demographic. There goes our Paxton demographic that listened to the show. <laughs> oh, my stars. What are we ever going to do? <laughs> But, you know, the Baldwin Pretty retirement key millennial right? demographic. Well, I, I was going to say the Baldwin uh, release. It did. It did hit me, man. I'm not going to lie, because the idea that of this run of the LOB era of the Seahawks just disintegrated so freaking quickly due to injury, mainly. I mean, sure, like Sherm left for another team. But the reason he left for another team is that. He was pretty damn injured and wanted too much money for being that damn injured. Right. Same thing with Earl. And then you think about Cliff uh, going out with injury, Cam going out with injury. Now Doug going out with injury. It seems like all these other teams, like I think of the Steelers, right? And like Troy Polamalu plays for like 10 years after he's 30 and is still good like the whole time. And like you get this five year swan song to like say goodbye to these players. And like somehow like, Cam was here and then he was just gone. Sherm was here and he was just gone. And it feels that way with Doug. Like he was here and then all of a sudden, like there's rumors that, you know, he's going to need a couple surgeries and then he's just gone. Like these guys just seem to like get abducted by aliens off the team. Like that's the part I'm struggling with. Every other team seems to get like Ray Lewis plays forever, right? Ed Reed plays forever and the Ravens get to, you know, celebrate him for like two years. Why don't, why, why didn't we get that? I feel cheated by the football gods. Do we only get one? Is Bobby Wagner going to be our guy? That would be fine. I mean, if I could at least get that. Although I see the news story that Bobby's preparing as if this is his last year with the team being in a contract <laughs> year. Right. Maybe, maybe he knows better, how to better negotiate than Sherman and Okun. But these guys who, these Seattle Seahawks players who decide to be their own agents, I don't like the track record of them not staying on the team. Bobby Wagner is going to be a Seahawk. He better be. He will be. The, all right. Talk about track records. How about the track record of the media, the national media drumming up drama around guys and their contracts that is inaccurate? What, what's inaccurate about the Bobby Wagner deal? Oh, he's preparing like this is last year as a Seahawk. Well, he said that he's going to be gone <laughs> for sure. 
He actually said that, though. Can't yeah. blame the media for that. Yeah, it's their fault. <laughs> you know, they're fishing for a soundbite, and he's finally like, ah, fine, I'll give you something. Okay, yeah. I, I'm preparing as if this could be my last year. Oh, my God, write a headline. Well, it makes sense because it is the last year that he's under contract. So, I mean, it, you can't fault a guy for taking that into consideration, I suppose. I guess. Especially when all his buddies are gone and KJ Wright's on a one-year deal. Dude, yeah. Well, you can think whatever you want and you can you can buy into the national media narrative because they love having controversies surround the Seattle Seahawks. Okay, well, who are the next guys that I'm going to get to root for then? Because it's not the same. You're exactly right. It's new. You get to you get to enjoy a whole nother set of guys for a whole nother set of reasons that fill up your cup in a way that the old guys never did, even though they were amazing. That's the beauty of accepting something new into your life. It's what you have to do. You have to focus like Pete and John say on what they can do, not what they can't do and what they aren't. But everything I read on Bleacher Report is so negative. I read that that Nick Vanette that he was among the lowest pass catching tight ends of any of the tight ends last year. Mm -hmm. And that the Seahawks have another guy who is, you know, a a not so talented fourth rounder that couldn't even break 200 yards. And they don't even mention that he was injured for most of the year. Yeah. They got hurt in like week four and then he's like from Montana. So he'll shake that off. Will Disley is going to be awesome this year. Mark my words. So I can count on Will Disley being awesome. Yeah. But but then I, I, I flipped to another bleacher report article and I see the power rankings of the defense and the Seahawks are at number 30. Right. All right. Uh, is it a reverse power ranking? No, I think because when I look at the company of theirs and it's Oakland at 32 and Tampa at 31, I think they're putting them with the bad teams. Huh? Interesting. I don't, I don't think this is this is a reverse power ranking. Miami, they have at 29. So 28 New York Giants. I understood last year a little bit more why the national media like Bleacher Report was confused as to how the Seahawks could have been good last year, because there were so many big names that left the team that year, even though they left the team relatively early in the year and the team still performed post their departures. Like I could understand, like just looking at it on paper and being like, oh, they lost this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Not how and when and what the team did without him and that sort of thing. I could kind of understand that. But then you got the national media coming out this year with this power ranking, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, number 30th. Well, who'd they lose? Frank Clark. And Earl? Kind of Earl. Because <laughs> what? Well, that's my point. I mean, that's you know, from the year when before. When did they lose Earl? Week four? Right. And yes, they lost Frank Clark, but you also have to understand that the Seahawks traditionally get the same amount of sacks every single year. They're going to get to right around 40 sacks like they always do. Yeah. Yeah. And be a top 10 defense in scoring. I don't again, because yards don't matter. They're a lot like Twitter. (laughs) Well, I hope you're right, dude. I am generally right. (laughs) I even have my buddy who I work with on these work trips, right? Yeah. Like while we're here in Arkansas, it's like, man, you've been spot on this trip. You're on fire this week. You know, you know when you, you know, what to do, and you've you've been you've been right with everything that you've said. I'm just, just continuing that right just now. Just in life, or or are you making Seahawks takes like behind my back? No, no, just like in life. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll elaborate later. Okay, good. Well, maybe we should move on to the second half of the show and get to some thank yous. We we got some people to thank this week. Holy smokes. Dude, I thank like like that's somehow enough. I I don't even know. Yeah, like things I that we just, like we owe people things. I guess I I don't even. Yeah, humbled is be it would be the word to start with, but we'll get to that. Getting into the second half of the show, and I I did I managed to go and look up cap space. Adam Seahawks are at just under twenty seven million for for cap space. That's pretty cool. And they've signed at least the majority of their rookie contracts. I think so. At least half of them. Right. But I think that cap space considers them actually signing all their rookies. Oh, I see. Okay. They know how much money to set aside for your rookies. So they just do that on the on the website. Right. Because it's slotted. Right. right? Yeah. And so you so you kind of know. Yeah. So that, you know, they could still do more along the defensive line. 
We've talked about Nick Perry came in. They could. Yeah. Who else is out there? Jamie Collins is out there. Yeah, I'm interested in Jamie Collins. Yeah. That, that I, for a year, sure. They could. They could still bring in some help. Yeah, I'd like to see him bring in one more dude. And Dominican Sue is out there. No, thank you. <laughs> Everybody's down on the Sue. Yeah, because he loafs until he makes the playoffs, and he's just he just goes rogue. And he's generally generally been on the dirty side too. Yeah, and he costs too much. Although no, thank teammates you. apparently enjoy him as a player. Neat. I'm saying this isn't about them. This is about me and how much I enjoy the team. <laughs> Let's keep the focus where it needs to be, and that's on me and my. So needs. you're saying if Sue plays for the team, you will not root very hard for him. <laughs> no, I'll just enjoy this team a little less. Okay. It was kind of like watching the Celtics this year with Kyrie. It just wasn't fun. See, now there's a true flat earther, whereas Geno Smith is kind of a tr- a flat earth poser. Well, who knows with Kyrie? He's so freaking flaky. <laughs> he was a flat earth. And then he was like, no, I just was doing that to, you know, poke the bear and get everybody riled up. Then he was back to, well, maybe. I was like, catfish. Thank you, Kyrie. For entertainment value, I suppose. That's what he claimed there for a while. Whatever. Him and Geno Smith can have a flat earth party. Maybe they could go sail off the edge of it together. Wow. Harsh words on your uh, Kyrie Irving. Dude, he blew up this good team this year with his, what is that word? Mercurial? Mercurial? I don't know. Mercurial? Mercurial. (laughs) Something like that. Whatever. With his crappy attitude. Mercurial? It's something like that. I don't know. Somebody look that up. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm using all my devices to do the pod. Are you telling me that I have to look it up? It's a word. Well, I recognize it as a word. Uh, it, it, it basically it means like uh, yeah it's like poor attitude and moody subject to sudden or unpredictable changes of mood or mind there we go oh it moody. is it is based off of uh, uh mercury maybe mercury was in retrograde this whole time for this season for the celtics i don't know yeah because it means changing and you know mercury notes the changing of temperature so mercurial is that what it is yeah Okay. How about that? There you go. Word of the day, people. There's your English lesson of the of the week for you folks. You're welcome. I still can't say the word. Well, how about we say thank you to some people? I think uh I think that's in order. Yeah. I, I was gonna be starting off with a thank you to Dustin Mock, but he took a back seat because DCH came in with his annual donation this year. Well, it's not a competition. I, I think it's kind of a competition because because DCH emailed me and he said, who's been the guy who's who's supported you the most in the past year? And I said, well, our associate producer, Dustin Mock, and he, you know, he's been donating at the associate producer level every month. And then he sent us a football this month and he goes, OK, well, here's a donation of fifteen hundred dollars. This is my annual donation. Boom. So does that make the DCH uh, like director of associate producers for the podcast? I think so. Does that give him like a title above Dustin? You know, those two are kind of in limited company. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think maybe they should arm wrestle over it. I don't know if we should have like a a podcast board of directors. They can compete for chairman and co-chair. No, that sounds like a boss. I don't want one of those. Well, they're not really boss. They're just, you know, like who we go to. I got you. For, for direction got you. and uh, to tell us what to do. Yeah, that sounds like a boss. I'm really good at being told what to do. I'm great with that. You are. Yeah. Yeah. DCH sends a, a note, says, just a quick note to say thank you for all you do to keep our Flocker community strong and connected. I've sent over the annual DCH donation, and I hope it brings you guys some flexibility to do some cool stuff. I'm proud to be able to support the show and the community. Looking forward to seeing you guys this year, hopefully week three for the Saints game. Until then, keep up the amazing work. We can't wait for the next show. Go Hawks from DCH. Yeah, go Hawks. You know, the DCH has been, I mean, with us since basically day one. And awesome listener, awesome part of the community. I am very much looking forward to seeing them week three versus the Saints. Uh, That's going to be a fun game. Yeah, you're locked in now. You have to come. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, you're you're right. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna block out that weekend for even scheduling work. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna be there. I'm doing it. 
And I think that this donation now qualifies us as a religious institution. So from now on, uh, we can just recommend that everyone donate 10% of their income. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Plant your seed. It'll come back to you. Thus saith the great uh, Hakra spirit. May the Hakra be with you, DCH. <laughs> oh. Well, let's send some Hakra to associate producer Dustin Mock as well. I mentioned him before. He, he sent in, Adam, what I think is likely to be our top prize for the 2019 Pick'em League. Ooh. What he sent was a signed Doug Baldwin football. And, Are you kidding me? And, I didn't know that. And it's from his rookie season. So it's inscribed with number 15 with a certificate <sighs> of authenticity from the Seattle Seahawks. It's really cute that you think that's going to be our top prize for the uh, Pick'em League because that's going to disappear from your house one day <laughs> and you're not going to know exactly where it went. You're like, huh, where'd that football go? <laughs> I know Adam huh. said he really wanted it. Huh. <laughs> that's yeah. weird. Yeah. And why is my window broken? Or, or you could just win the Pick'em League. <laughs> yeah, that feels that feels unattainable. Rather than vandalize my house. Yeah, no, you know what you did. You deserve it. That's pretty cool. Well, thanks to thanks to Dustin for uh, uh, really motivating me to maybe like put a little more effort into the picks. Although I feel feel like the more effort I put into the picks, the worse it goes. Yeah. Well, you, you did beat me last year because I'm good at it. I have two really solid prizes. I have so I have that one from Dustin. God, that's a sweet prize. And I have a signed Russell Wilson mini helmet. Oh, that's pretty killer, too. I know. All right. Gosh, man, the little flockers, uh, they're going to have cool prizes to to go for this year. They had awesome prizes this last year. I know. The loot that w- was given out this last year from the Pick'em League was pretty damn impressive. We've been getting better. Yeah. Well, not, not just us. I mean, like, you know, people like Dustin coming through and, you know, Daniel Weinholz, you know, like. All those guys. Oh yeah, the the buck knives. Catfish. Come yeah, that, man. That again. Yeah. Yeah, I was using mine up at the cabin just this last weekend. It is the sharpest knife I've ever owned in my life, by far. It is super freaking nice. Oh sweet. Love that thing. It's a permanent fixture on my backpack belt now. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's my. It's now my the new designated wilderness knife. Moving back into thank yous, DK in at twelve twelve. He's been welcomed into the ring of honor. So, DK, welcome to the flock. It's about time, man. Uh, DK needed to be among the the little flockers in the Ring of Honor for a long time now. He's an awesome dude. Yeah, he, he did make sure to point out that uh, it, it, although his initials are DK, it, it, he's not DK Metcalf. Oh. Oh, well, different DK then. Well, why is he in the Ring of Honor? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I knew which DK it was. He said, wanted to celebrate your guys' return to the Seahawkers podcast by finally cleansing myself of my freeloading center ways. (laughs) Plus, Brandon getting choked up like DK Metcalf over dropping under 300 flockers plucked at my heartstrings. Shout out to you guys for making long drives fly by. Keep being awesome. Hey, well, thanks, man. We're we're trying. And, uh, you know, the reaction to us just making the simple decision of just like sticking with, you know, the Seahawkers podcast feed has been more than positive. I think I think people are happy about this. I know. I think everybody feels like this is the better place. Well, you know, it it, it did make me realize that uh, I think, you know, unless somebody's hiring us to like actually be our, our boss, that we're we're not going anywhere. No, I mean they would both have like whatever. The only way we go somewhere is if somebody both gave us a full time salary. Of significance. Yeah, and still let us put about as much work in as we do right now. I'm even willing to put in a little bit more. If it means I don't have to grind wheels. You know, well, you know what? You're right. You you probably could work a little harder. (laughs) (laughs) What are you trying to say, Brandon? I'm just saying. I'm working as hard as I can over here. I put in a full minute and 30 seconds of preparation for every episode. How dare you question my work ethic? You, you made it sound like you have more time that, that you could be doing stuff. I'm just saying I'm, I'm maxed out over here. No, I'm just, what I'm saying is, is that if I weren't grinding wheels. Yeah. Like, you know, okay. and, you know, spending, spending, you know, time traveling to bum Catfish! Arkansas for no reason, seemingly. Yeah. I, I'd have more time for the pod. Hey, one last thanks to uh, Sam Gelber, who's in for $12. You know, we were making pre-draft bets in the Ring of Honor, and Sam lost his. Um, and that's also why we got the raise from Lisa last week, because she she missed out on Seattle picking up Thick Neck Jesus. 
So that's why we, she, she sent along that raise. She thought for sure he was going to be a Seahawk. So I'm a little worried about some of our flockers. I think they may have what they call a, quote, problem. Because if you're gambling on John Schneider's picks <laughs> in the draft, good luck. Well, Sam wasn't it was Sam wasn't gambling on John Schneider's picks. I think he, he was making he said Nick Bosa wouldn't go to the 49ers, I think. We're we're just trying to take some of the ideas of of leading into the draft that mm-hmm. everybody was sure was gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Like I cause I bet against Kyler Murray going to the Cardinals. Why did you do that? They they weren't gonna it made too much sense for the Cardinals to do that. And so I didn't think they'd do that. But see, here's the thing. It made too much bad sense for the Cardinals to do that. That was, I'm still stoked that they took him at number one. Now they locked him into a really high rookie contract that's all guaranteed with their coach that can't win games. They, this is going to be fantastic. God, I love watching that that organization crash and burn. I hope you're right. I, I, I you don't need to hope. I would like them to be bad, too. They will be bad. Book it. I think with their general manager, it's it's pretty much a given. But the only likable thing about the Arizona Cardinals uh, for the past 10, 15 years has been Larry Fitzgerald. Period. End of story. Really? The only thing? Yeah. I like Johnson. Johnson? That You like Johnson? You just, Boy, that didn't sound good at all. <laughs> that didn't sound good. No. What did I say? <laughs> you eat pieces of crap for breakfast? <laughs> I like David Johnson. David okay. David Johnson is in the Larry Fitzgerald conversation. No, he's not. He's not good. He wasn't good last year because they didn't know how to use him the right way. Oh, so you're blaming the the coaching staff? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure Cliff Kingsbury and the Air Raid will unlock the secrets of uh, David Johnson and his amazing running ability. They're going to get more out of David Johnson. That's not saying much. Then the Cardinal Cardinals are going to have to pay David Johnson. Oh wait, no, they already did pay him big money, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. Because they're the Cardinals. I tried to tell everybody David Johnson's not that good. Nobody would listen. He's good. And now the Rams have their MVP caliber player with grandma knees. That's cool. Their their quarterback has been exposed. Their whole offensive system. Oh, this is, I, I'm so looking forward to this season. It's going to be so much fun. Rams lost some pieces on defense. Yeah. And Jimmy Garoppolo is still made out of glass. This is going to be an awesome season. Yeah. David Johnson has a $13 million cap hit next year. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. God bless the Arizona Cardinals. <laughs> I wait. Where, where's uh, is Bidwell still the owner of the Cardinals? Oh yeah. All right. The, if he's listening, what I need him to do immediately is give Steve Kime a phone call and give him a lifetime John Gruden kind of contract as to be their GM. I need that. You to need happen that to happen in my life. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to hire somebody like Cliff Kingsbury, you can hand out one more bad contract. Let's go. Oh, and I was wrong. It's not 13. It's it's only 9.8. So oh, only 9.8. But, but it does jump up to 14 the next year. So yeah. When even CJ Anderson is a better player than him. I don't know if I'd go that far, dude. <laughs> what, wouldn't you? No. Well, then you would be wrong. I'd rather have Johnson than CJ Anderson. Although for the money, You'd I would rather suppose. have Johnson. I love Johnson. <laughs> we, I, oh, what was it last episode? Was that sack? We uh, the yeah. short area quickness. Okay, I wonder what Johnson's sack numbers would be. What how he scores in the sack? <laughs> I about spit my coffee out in the, all over the table. Man, how did we only get a two star review from John WH ninety three on on iTunes this week? This has been amazing. <laughs> when did this happen? He, he, he sent in a review, said here for Rob Staten. Says Rob Staten is the best thing about the show. Too bad he's only here for the draft and other rare appearances. He gets five oh. stars and I read his blog every day. Adam purposefully misunderstands football terminology to make fun of it and op- oversimplifies everything to the point of wondering why anyone should even need his commentary. Either he ends up being good or not. Her der 50% chance of him making the team or not. Uh, am I wrong? Brandon is better because at least he doesn't have contempt for the audience. He will entertain ideas beyond the oversimplified ranting of his lonely co-host. At least this is better than Locked on Seahawks podcast. <laughs> well, boy, I wonder what those poor bastards put out. Actually, I think their show, I, I think they stopped doing their show. So we're, we're at least better than a defunct show. 
Sorry, dude. I don't I don't like talking about uh, things that either A, don't matter or B, are drummed up to be a lot more than they are. Like, I just I just don't care. Like some people try to make things a nuanced thing that aren't nuanced. Sorry. Like, uh, what, what do you want? But I appreciate the review. We take them all. And that's why we that's why we read them. I'm guessing he doesn't like he, maybe he was upset about your long levers comment. Well, uh, that's the only thing I can think of of misunderstanding football terminology. Oh, I don't know. I, who knows what he what he meant by that? I mean, that's we've okay. Been, we, we, we've been going off of, uh, you know, silly terminology leading into the draft for a while now. Like it's an annual tradition. Yeah. Well, the 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 fun thing is, is that to actually simplify something, you have to know it very well inside and out to start with. And you know, hey, look if you if you love speculation and combine numbers and all that stuff, then draft guys are your thing, and that's cool. That's why I bring Rob on. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> because he's good at that, and I'm glad that he likes that, and I like Rob. And the thing is, as I'm inclined to like, what's his uh, uh, the handle name here? John W H ninety three. John W H ninety three. Yeah, I'm inclined to like that guy too because he, at least he has an opinion. Oh yeah, good for him. He's tuning in. Yeah. Done. Well, I can tell you one thing for sure, Brandon. This week, he's either listening or he's not. <laughs> Herder. Herder. I do like how it's spelled like with five R's uh, on each her and der. Oh, well, that's where he got it wrong. I only say herder with three R's each. So, Oh, missed out. Yeah. Do your research, John HW 94 Niner. Here's whatever. another review. This one's five stars. It says great pod. Adam and Brandon are fantastic. And this is the best podcast for Seahawks fans. That That's cool. Apparently, uh, apparently I don't talk too simple for those people. Not trying to bring you down, dude. Oh, I'm fine. It, this trip has been bringing me down. That's, that's really what the, the problem is. Do we need to get into your trip? Is it time for do better? I, th- I think it's time for do better. Okay. All right, man. Might do better this week. It's for Catfish! United Airlines. Every time you go on a trip, it's an airline. Well, if I book a flight and at the end of the flight or the process of flying to my destination, I could have at any point I could have gotten in my car and driven to the destination faster. The airline has wholly failed as at doing airline things. It's true. I, I do believe that the benefit of airline travel is you get places faster than, than driving. That's the idea. That's the idea. Because it's not more fun than it's not more fun than driving. No, I because I now I'm out of control, right? Like I, the gate agents have power over me. The TSA has power over me. The pilot has power over me. The guy running the gate has, you know, the the air jet bridge has power over me. Like everybody, it's all out of my control. If I have my car, I can go where I want. If there's a curb between me and the next parking lot and I need to go over there, I just drive over the curb because I'm in control. <laughs> that I, I like that. So it starts out Thursday. I'm supposed to leave Missoula at 8 a.m. All right, fine. So I get up at 6.30 pack the rest of my tools, get ready to get on the plane. And United had the courtesy to text me that the plane would be delayed uh, till three o'clock at about seven 15 after I'm already at the airport. So thanks. So uh, they've known for a while that this plane isn't going to fly. If they know that they're not going to be able to get it off the ground until three o'clock that afternoon. (laughs) All right, fine. So I go back home. I take a nap. It'll be fine. Again, get up, go to the airport. Uh, at two o'clock, an hour before my flight at two 30, I get another text notification from United as I'm sitting, uh, just outside of, uh, uh, TSA. And it's a notification to let me know that we're now not leaving until six o'clock. Now I'm starting to wonder this broken plane seems like it's real hard to fix. <laughs> I'm super excited to get on it. Number one. So I go back to the ticket counter and stand there in front of the agent. And this is a recurring theme, by the way. You'll hear this a few times for about two hours while they try to figure out how to rebook the remainder of my flight. Yeah, because it turns out when they delayed it to three o'clock, my trip, which I was going from Missoula to Denver, Denver to Little Rock. Yeah, it it impacts your other legs of travel. Right. The Denver to Little Rock part was automatically rescheduled with some computer algorithm, which magically deleted half my catfish reservation. All right. Which, again, Put a pin in that because that's going to be a recurring theme throughout this story. So she can't make it 
do my second half of my flight and redo it because it's magically gone and you can't just magically put it back. The segment is gone. That's what I've been told. The se- my second segment of my journey is now gone. So she rebooks me on a flight that leaves Denver at 820. Yeah. And it's a two hour flight from Missoula to Denver and we're leaving at six o'clock. We're scheduled to get in at like 804. Yeah, you have a little bit of time. Yeah. They're, maybe they're banking on more delays. Right. They, 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 they were going to fly me into one end of the airport and we we're taking off for Little Rock in the opposite end of the airport. If you've ever looked it up, it's a little over a mile. And they probably sat you in the back of the plane, too. <laughs> so you're the last one they to get did? off. <laughs> but here's the best part. As we're just now leaving Missoula, we all get on the plane at six o'clock. Everybody's ready to go. And the Missoula ground crew, which everybody's heard me talk about before, the dumbest ass ground crew in the history of ground crews has had everybody's baggage since three and yet never loaded it. Oh, jeez! And there's two other planes going out that were originally scheduled. And so they load our baggage last out of all three of the planes. And we sit on the runway for an hour. Wow. For an hour to wait for the bags that have been there for three hours. They could have put on forever ago. Thanks, Missoula ground crew. So finally get to Denver at about 1135 at night. <laughs> like It took forever. No, we got there. Let's see. We took out at seven. We got there about like 930 because we finally got off kind of like 730. Okay, so you still missed it by over an hour. Yeah, they typhooned it. So we get it. We get off the <laughs> we get off. The, they didn't blow it. They typhooned it. We get, so we get off the plane. And uh, the gal at the desk had told me, well, when you get there, call 1-800-UNITED-1 to rebook your flight. Yeah, I've talked to those jokers before, and they just don't do their job. They don't. Like, I've tried to reschedule flights, and they only reschedule, like, one of three flights. And all of a sudden, you don't have flights. Oh, wow. That's what they do. So I was like, no, we're going to the customer service desk. So we go to the customer service desk. We managed to get in line before the line started to extend past the little, you know, rope thingies, right? Because apparently all the other planes in the world got diverted because of weather to Denver and everybody has to have their flight rescheduled. Now. Oh, well. So we stand in line for another hour and a half till we get up to the front. We get up to the front and then an agent comes up and says, hey, will you go down three gates and talk to that agent over there? <laughs> Six people. We need you to do that. All right, fine. So I go over there and I wait again for the two people you know, that weren't in front of me who are now in front of me. Right. To finally, talk to the gate agent. Stand in front of the gate agent for two hours while they can't rebook my flight because the second segment has been deleted automatically. It's still screwed up. Sounds like a computer issue. So they give me the, the, the next morning. They're like, we're going to try to put you standby. Now, this is now Friday morning. We're going to we're going to put you standby. And again, I'm supposed to be in the mill Friday morning in Little Rock, Arkansas. Right. We're going to try to put you on standby at 11 o'clock. OK, fine. All the flights are booked. All of America's flights are booked. All of Delta's flights are booked. Everybody's flights are booked. So we're going to try to put you on standby. All right, fine. Show up the next day. Go to the go to get my standby ticket. It's invalid. <laughs> can't be. We can't be pulled up. Go see a gate agent. So I go and I stand in front of another gate agent for about an hour while they try to Catfish. print me out a boarding pass. So they finally give me a boarding pass. We go to do standby. And the guy looks at me. She goes, why did they book you standby on this? I go, what do you mean? Not only were we oversold, we're oversold by like four seats. You're not getting on this plane. Oh, jeez. Lo and behold, we do not get on that plane. So I go back to be sure that we are still booked on the plane that was going out the next day on Saturday at 10 a.m. And gate agent pulls it up. They can't find it. Mine, mine's gone. Like, it's just, it's still deleted. And they, they, even though it is already rebooked twice now by two different gate agents, Sit there for another couple hours in front of the gate agent while she assures me they have it all figured out. Print me out a boarding pass, the whole thing. Here's a voucher for a hotel. You get to stay another lovely night in Denver, Colorado. Wow. This is now night two. I could have been there by that night if I had just gotten in my car and started driving Thursday morning. I would have been there. They they couldn't have flown you maybe like a little closer, like to Dallas or Memphis. Negative. Kansas City. No, Houston. Houston is where they love flying people into. Oh. So... I get up the next morning, go to the airport, scan in my boarding pass, eh, error, invalid boarding pass. <laughs> I get to stand in front of United Desk again for another couple hours while they finally figure it out to the point to where they had five people staring at one computer trying to figure out this one boarding pass. And I got to the point where I, I just looked at the supervisor. I was like, look, this is how this is going to go. You can't get this printed out in 15 minutes. You're walking me through the TSA. Okay. Being like, I know he doesn't have a pass, but he has a pass. 
And then we're going to go to the gate agent and you're going to say, I know he doesn't have a pass, but he's sitting in seat 5E. <laughs> And like he's he's sitting there and I'm getting on that catfish plane and I'm flying out of here. They finally get it printed. I get on the plane and three days later, I finally get here oh. only to go to work the next morning and get set up to have a guy fall off a roof three stories and freaking die right next to the machine that we we're supposed to work on and no work be done. They kick everybody off the job site. Like, this trip is freaking cursed. This poor bastard died. Like, I, I've, I've now been on the road. This is going on day five. Yeah. And they have the whole mill shut down today, too. And I have done zero work. I could have flown out today and been here for tomorrow morning to actually do all the work. You, uh, you were not meant to do any work in Arkansas. No. And so to United for making a trip longer somehow by airplane than it was by ground. Do better. Wow. See, I'm glad you saved these discussions with me for the podcast because I've heard your travel horror stories before, but this is among the top ones. And RIP to the poor bastard that fell off the roof, man. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what happened there. That sucks. Yeah. Contractor, man. There's not good. But yeah, United was uh, was a problem. Well, uh, that's going to just dwarf the uh, competency of of my do better because my do better is for the Miami Dolphins. Oh, Miami Dolphins this week signed running back Mark Walton, former University of Miami running back who apparently has been arrested three times this year. Wow. Their head coach, Brian Flores, the former uh, defensive coordinator for the New England Patriots, says, I think people deserve a second chance. I believe that. <laughs> Yeah, how about fourth chances? Fourth, maybe even fourth. Uh, he says, I think that's the case. I don't want to judge people based on one one incident, two incidents. He only goes as far as two. I think it's a case-by-case case situation for a player and just for people in general. That's kind of my stance. Here's the, here, here's the thing. Walton, he's not even that good. He, he played for the Bengals last year. He had 14 carries for 34 yards in his rookie season with Cincinnati. <laughs> He was drafted in, in the fourth round after playing three seasons with Miami. If you do the math on that, Adam, 14 carries, yeah. 34 yards. It's not good. 2.4 yards per carry. That's that's fewer yards per carry than his average number of arrests for the entire year of 2019. He's at three arrests for 2019. <laughs> and he still has seven more months to go in 2019. That average number could go up. <laughs> And we've talked about it. You've, we've seen how you can get good running backs in the sixth round, the seventh round as undrafted free agents. Out of all those guys, the Miami Dolphins couldn't find one guy with a, a 2019 arrest record under three to bring on the team. By the end of the year, this guy has a good chance of having more arrests than the Dolphins have wins. So for Brian Flores of the Miami Dolphins, do better. Apparently, Brian Flores has not heard the phrase once a coincidence, twice as a trend, three times as a you problem. Because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Walton and thinking, maybe this is a you problem. Three times this year. Like, ar being arrested three times in a lifetime. Three's a high number for that. Yeah. I think, what, see, I've only been arrested twice in my entire life. See? You're under three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you've had 40 years. This guy's done three in under five months. Yeah, they, it's a, that's not a good trend. No, it just seems like why? Why? For a guy who had, <laughs> for a guy who had two. You sound like Nancy Kerrigan. Why? why? Man, you know how dated that reference is? Yeah. Have you seen old. Have you seen Tanya Harding lately? Yes. She's not young. No, no. <laughs> She's on the uh, celebrity cooking show that I watch with my wife. That doesn't surprise me because she looks it's, a little like I think it's a show about really bad cooks. Oh, how have I not been called for this? <laughs> well, I think you do have. To, well, no, you don't have to be a celebrity. I'm a celebrity. I've, I've gone over this. I'm like a V list celebrity. Like if it's a list, B list, C list. Like, yeah. So the celebrities are Jim J. Bullock, Tanya Harding. That I recognize. The guy who said dynamite uh, from dynamite. Yeah, dynamite. What's that from? Was it good times? I think I have just as much star power as most of these people. And with less assaulting in my background. Who, who else? Who, who are the other celebrities in it? 
Oh, uh, Farrah Fawcett. I thought she was dead. No, she's still alive. Are we sure? Pretty sure. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I could have sworn that she had passed on. No, she's still very much alive. Jeez. Okay. I think she is like 80, though. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What were we talking about? Are we on to better yeah. life yet? Yeah, we are. All right. My better life, Brandon, this week, my better life than Skip Bayless is for the poor bastards that work at United. <laughs> I will say that every one of those gate agents tried their hearts out to get things to go right and put in time and call for supervisors and called the help desk and tried everything in their power as a human being to overcome the stupidity of the system that is United Airlines only to be beat down and thwarted at every, every uh, step of the way. But they did try. They did do it with a smile even when I was mad. And uh, they're good people. They're computing staff. They're programmers. Whoever the hell like comes up with the rest of this, the schedulers, they suck nuts. But the people that, that, that uh, work the front gate, you guys are better at life than Skip Bayless. You tried hard. It does sound like they're working with uh, one hand behind their back, though. Oh, yeah. Well, look, and they would always like wheel the screen around for me to look at it. <laughs> and they like, you know, it's like I know what's going on because it's literally DOS. <laughs> the operating system is DOS. Oh. <laughs> they, ha- they haven't upgraded They're to Windows 95 in, like, C yet. Colon, you know, <laughs> yeah, like in acronyms for all the airports and like, you know, commands. Like it, it's not even a it's not even a Windows ish based program. There's no there's no graphic user interface. There's no GUI. It's all DOS. Windows ninety five has been out for uh, you know almost at least over twenty years. We were sophomores in high school. <laughs> what about Windows three point two? That would be an upgrade from what these poor these poor bastards have to work with. Graphical user interfaces are a fad. Right. You don't know what's going to happen when Y2K comes around. It felt like Y2K had come around on this trip. I'm telling you. My better at life this week is for Doug Baldwin. If you're not going to if you're not going to let me do a tribute episode, we at least have to send Baldwin I didn't out. say I wouldn't let you. I just said, like, maybe it's something to think about that. We might want to wait. I'm just still in denial. So I am, too. I'm not ready. About. It's going to take me at least if even if we do do it. And I said, do do. It's going to take <laughs> it's going to take a couple of weeks before I'm even just ready to prepare myself to put to, to put something together. I can't I can't wait for the uh, reviews for this week that come in because you're talking about Johnson and doo doo on the Johnson <laughs> sack doo doo. This is going to be Lisa's favorite episode. <laughs> yes, it Lisa is. in Seattle. She, this is I do this for you, Lisa. Yes. Doug Baldwin. Two-time Pro Bowler, 2016, 2017, NFL touchdown receiving leader in 2015. Somehow didn't make the Pro Bowl that year, but whatever. NFC champion, 2013, 2014, career 6,500 receiving yards, 49 touchdowns, 493 receptions. Super Bowl 48, Super Bowl champion. It's going to be tough, man. Greatest undrafted receiver of all time? Is it him and Rod Smith? Is that the argument? Yeah, the, you know, for undrafted wide receivers, it's got to be a pretty short list that have put in that kind of career that Doug Baldwin has. And he might not even be done. He's not done. Uh, One of the heartbeats of this team, an amazing leader, a hard worker. Everybody loved his fire and his grit, his one-handed catches, his amazing route running the quickness in and out of his breaks, his chemistry with Russell Wilson on third down, the magic that was created there time and time again, it will be missed. He wrote on Twitter, and this was one of the tweets that he was writing to his younger self, where he says, the end of one journey sees the beginning of another. And guess what? It will be one hell of a journey. You will feel emotional and physical pain you never knew existed. You will fail over and over again. But don't worry, all of it will be the reason why you succeed. So for Doug Baldwin, Douglas, Dwayne Baldwin, you better at life than Skip Bayless. So here's my only problem with the letter to himself over Twitter. Don't you have problems with this? Let's say that Doug Baldwin does find a DeLorean somewhere with a flux capacitor and he's able to go back in time 
to deliver said message to young Doug Baldwin. Right. The problem is, is that it's over Twitter and it doesn't exist when he's going to give it to young Doug Baldwin. I don't like this is there, there's a lot of problems. here. Well, you don't want to give it to young Doug Baldwin, because then if you do, it sets a new timeline where maybe Doug Baldwin doesn't play for the Seahawks. And then that that particular timeline is robbed from the greatness of having Doug Baldwin as a member of the Seattle Seahawks. So what you're trying to say is hide all the DeLoreans from Doug Baldwin. Yes. And with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. And guess what? It will. Oh, wait. and so he, and this is the one <laughs> I can edit this together. Don't worry. Oh, I know you can. It's just fun when it, it, I enjoy it when you struggle a little bit now and then. <laughs>